Welcome to the first episode of the Then and Now podcast featuring Chris Peel. Chris Peel is a very important figure in the history of aggressive inline skating. Most likely, you've worn one of his designs on your body, or you've held one of the magazines he worked on in your hands. He worked for Daily Bread Magazine, DNA Magazine, and did all the branding for Ground Control, 4x4, NIM, Vicious, and Big Wheel Blading. Chris is a very good friend of mine, so I'm really excited about this interview. If you enjoy this episode, make sure and hit the like button below. Subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon to be notified of all upcoming videos. If you have any comments or suggestions afterwards, you can leave those below as well. All right, let's get started with the interview. This should be a fun one. So just to give you what I'm doing, I am starting a YouTube channel for inline skating. And cool. basically what the channel is going to focus on is kind of my past and present in skating yeah. and having to do with a lot of, you know, things and people I've been involved with throughout the years, but also, you know, current skaters and current events within skating, you know, like touch base on that, but it's going to be a lot of like, you know, historical things. So I've been lo logging, you know, all these mini DV tapes, hi eight tapes, VHSC tapes, and I'm going to make episodes with each tape on the YouTube channel. I'm going to try to have, um, narrative with skaters who are in the you know on the tapes that kind of talk I, over can't, discuss can't wait to, can't wait to see them you know kind of discuss yeah thank you yeah. thank you so and then you know just interviews with people like you people you know some people might not know who you are by name but they know what you've done in skating if they're around in the late 90s early 2000s you know you worked for dna magazine in uk right yeah and then you went to mm -hmm. San Diego, you worked for Daily Bread, you involved with John Elliott with the, basically the whole design concept of ground control. And then you teamed up with us for, from the beginning with Rattel, doing the 4x4 logo, the Vicious logo, the Nim logo, Rattel logo, yeah. dozens of t-shirts. And, you know, and then you did the print campaign for ground control as well. So you have a big, like a very important part in role playing history, you know, with some of the biggest brands and biggest magazines. And I want to thank you for everything you did for the sport. And, you know, those who don't know you, now they do, you know. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. So just going back to, you know, like what you were just saying, I mean, you know, yes, I uh, was lucky to be involved in rollerblading and like all that stuff you just outlined. But just to say that the only reason I was able to do that was because you, people like yourself, um, you know, the people at Daily Bread, Corey, Casey, you know, John Elliott, Brian, Shima, all were so kind to me and took, you know, I mean, you in particular, you give me somewhere to stay. You were just like, anyone that knows you knows you're just like an incredibly kind person. And, you know, you were just, the things you did for me, like is the only reason that I was able to stay in America and like, be here and meet my wife and do all the things I've done. So thanks to you. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. And, no, and I'm just I'm, you know, watching you progress in life with work and your career, it's been very fulfilling for me, you know, to see how well you've done and with your family and everything. Um yeah. it's cool, you know, we're I know we don't talk a lot these days, but you know, we're just like I'll always consider you like a a, a great, great friend of mine and you know we've we've been through a lot together <laughs> yeah we have likewise i want to go Thank back you. to you know when you and i met it was back in 1999 i was yeah. in england and we met at playstation skate park in london and we were both judging the british nationals that was definitely a wild skate park and the uk scene at that time i remember was a pretty wild group of kids and i remember so many different accents I couldn't understand 75% of the kids at the park that day. <laughs> but... I guess the thing that's really interesting now is like, I'm sure you've noticed this, a lot of guys of our era and girls now are like starting to get their skits out of the closet. So there's a lot of, I think people that were there on that day, even competing, you know, Anani Maki, Paul O'Toole, I saw has started skating again. Yeah, I've seen um, that. You know, and there is guys that have been there since the beginning, like Sam Cross and, you know, um, other guys in London, 
uh, Jack Ely, I, I think, is still running Loka skits in London. I mean, yeah, yeah, he is. There, there's a lot of those guys that were there at that competition that were, you know, are still doing it today, and that's pretty incredible. Um, and it's pretty cool. And yeah, I mean, that skate park as well. Do you remember that drop rail? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was a lot of falls. I remember in the video I filmed that year was Last Call, my Europe trip, and there's some of the carnage from PlayStation Park that day in the video. So you grew up in England. You grew up in Wakefield outside Leeds. Yeah. And when did you start skating? Oh, so I started skating when I was 12 or 13. And it was because I saw one of my good friends, uh, it was called Jackson Lee. And he and I shared a love of like comic books and punk rock and video games. And um, he had gotten a pair of roller derby um, skates because his best friend had, an, or a guy in his neighborhood, and the guy in his neighborhood was called Dean Jagger. And Dean had a younger brother called Ben. So back then, yeah, we were like 12. And then Ben, he was a few years younger. So he might not have been any older than like, I, I don't know how much younger he was, maybe like nine um, around that. And I remember going and seeing Dean doing like in a in just in a school play, playground doing back crossover. Like he was really, he could skate. He could skate a pair of these like, you know, hard plastic roller derby skates. Like, you know, most people would skate a hockey skate and it was, that was it. Just um, Jackson got a pair. I didn't really know Dean very well at the time. Um, Jackson bought a pair and then I bought a pair and my brother bought a pair. So I'm 42 now, so it's 30 years ago. So, and Dean Jagger, for you, those of you who don't know, is also an actor now. And he's been in Game of Thrones he and in different Thrones. shows, different movies, different TV shows, doing well, yeah. you know, doing well for himself. Um, yeah, and your he brother, is, Mar- He's an actor and his brother's a director. They did a film called... I, I saw, I haven't seen it yet. I've been meaning to watch it called Carbon Nash, where he's a vampire slayer. It's on Netflix, also a right? Vampire. Yeah. And uh, uh, Corey Feldman's in it and plays a transvestite. Perfect. That sounds like his vampire role. Trans, a vampire transvestite. So the Jaggers not only inspired you to get into skating to an extent, yeah. they also had one of the biggest skate parks in Europe, Rehab at the time. How much time did you spend at rehab? So that, it was, uh, we, I mean, my, myself and my brother, uh, it was a bus ride. We had to get a bus for about half an hour. So end to end, it was probably like an hour and a half journey. And I'd say between the ages of 15, 16, and 18, yeah, so probably, you know, three or so years, we were, we'd go three times a week. We'd go as early as we could on a weekend day. And then as soon as we could, you know, if we could get out of school, actually, we'd probably ask my dad to drive us um, so we could get there in time to, like, catch, you know, late session and then pick us up as late as he'd <laughs> agree to pick us up. <laughs> Your parents are very cool. I always enjoyed spending time with them. Yeah. Um, so... Then when did you start getting interested in doing art? At the same time or? Yeah, I, I drew. It was actually, you know, right around, you know, I was hanging out with Jackson and we like, we're just always doodling logos and, you know, sketches and cartoons and things. And yeah, it was like really kind of like mid to late high school. And then actually one of my qualifications that um, was the first kind of, I guess job but definitely the first thing I did in rollerblading was do some art for J- the Jaggers clothing company in the UK at the time that was called Puberty Clothing. Yeah and I remember Puberty. Yeah I drew some some characters for them and they uh, put them on t-shirts and cool. so on. Yeah. And then uh, did you do any other work with any blading related companies before you started illustrating for dna 
We're doing layout for DNA. No, no, it was uh, that was it. It was it was just that, and then um, I took a year out of. I met Lee Ma and um, yeah, I mean there were there were a few people down that were connected to DNA. I mean, James Aldridge eventually ended up being there with me at the time. But I think it was really Lee, Matt, and kind of the Southern crew that I, I, I ended up, we did a trip. We went down to Milton Keynes um, for, I think it was a trade show. It was like kind of, you know, the equivalent of ASR. So it was like the British Championships was like the, you know, big skate competition. And they also did a trade show around it for rollerblading. So rollerblading was big at the time, even you know, the recreational aspects of it, but then, right. you know, like, you know, it was kind of like the England version of the X Games or whatever. Um, I think it was televised, I can't remember. Um, but it was, you know, it was like a big deal at the time. So we went down and spent a lot more time with the kind of the, the guys that were down in the South, you know, both in the Midlands and in Milton Keynes, Birmingham, and then down in, you know, the, like the London, everybody came. So everybody came up from the South. Right. And we, we knew them because they'd come up to rehab and skate the skate park and we'd see them at other events and stuff. But I think that was like one of the, one of the times that we really kind of connected with, with Lee um, and, you know, the other people down there. How did you discuss with Lee to start working for DNA? Did he approach you? So he was... He was working with them, but I want to say he'd he'd have to correct me on this, but I want to say he wasn't like full time with them at the time. He was kind of doing a little bit of Lee was always doing a little bit of all sorts. Mm -hmm. Um but I I I was really interested. I was I needed to I was gonna take a year out from university. So I went down and I met the editor down there. And it wasn't that it wasn't necessarily the editor because they had two magazines. They had a hockey magazine and then they had DNA. So DNA was almost like a spin-off from this pub. It was a it was a company that had a bunch of as magazines. So they got all the distri distribution sorted out. So right. they had multiple different sports publications. One of them was a hockey, like a roller hockey magazine, and then they were dabbling in um, you know, action sports. So Lee'd been working with him for a while, and there was this one sales guy that took myself and James. So James uh, was also a graphic designer, and they were just looking for people to come and like work there and help them because someone was leaving. And I remember this. There was this like really pretty skeezy sales guy that took us to this fancy lunch, and he actually like uh kind of did this thing that he thought that was really funny he ordered as a shot of vodka but it was a thai chili vodka and it was insanely spicy like the, the spiciest and i was 17 18 he's like yeah you go yeah you go yeah you go drink these so i ended up in the bathroom puking for like 15 minutes after it trying to like like hide it like because it was like trying to sell us on working there at the right same time. that's really funny it was really weird. And he was like in his 30s, you know? He was so just like fucking with these kids. So you took the job at DNA? It was the last issue before they went out of business. Okay, that's why I thought it was like towards the end. So they knew they were going out of business. Uh -huh. they, this guy kind of lied to us and told us that there was a future in the business and it wasn't. And I committed to a year out of university. I went and I worked there for um, maybe two months and then the magazine folded. James and I lived in a hostel in Oxford because they were based in Oxford. Um, and we lived in this like crazy hostel, you know, like it was just like, it was ran by New Zealanders in the middle of Oxford. And we got our tongues pierced and we set our shirts on fire and did all kinds of dumb stuff that 18, 19 year olds do. <laughs> so the, so you, you were planning on taking a year off to work at DNA, but it folded. So is that yeah. why you ended up in San Diego working for Daily Bread? Was that the year uh, yeah. you spent there? So what happened was I, I went back to home. So I was I moved, you know, I was living with my mom and dad. And um I ended up taking like temp work. So working in you bit, you know, you sign up to a temp agency and they give you like give get you like minimum wage work. So I was going to 
like printers that needed people to like take a piece of mail that you get to your house and like stick a thing in it and put it right. in an envelope and do that for eight hours and I, I was getting pretty depressed to be honest it wasn't um it, it, it was I was definitely going through a really rough spot you know like my, my family started talking to me like you know you're not yourself stuff like that and then my brother we'd always read you know we'd read daily bread since we could get hold of it and my brother was like hey why don't you um send a letter to daily bread and or an email i think i think it's in an email it might have been a handwritten letter back then um you know seeing if they need an art director and he just pestered me until i did it and angie responded saying that she'd be at, uh, in manchester at, um the manchester skate park for a big competition I can't remember if it was the next British, British Nationals. Might have been. Um, and I met Angie there. At like, it was the end of the day. She was leaving. I remember it was raining and there was this like overhang outside. It was just a giant warehouse with an overhang. And I like had my pop, giant fucking like zip up portfolio and I like unzipped it and laid it out on the ground in the rain outside um, the skate park. And, um, you know, Angie just hired me on the spot, basically. Awesome. Well, and then you ended up in San Diego. And we ended up living together. Yes. So, the, yeah, uh, that was, I think that was all 99, because I moved to San Diego in 2000. I think it was about six months after I lived there, because yeah. I lived in, in Spring Valley for a while with Zebulon. And then yeah. we got that place on Monroe Avenue. and. Uh -huh. in north park yeah behind the jamaican was he there then oh yeah didn't we used to buy weed from him from time to time uh yeah but really bad weed they used to, terrible yeah they used to have those bricks of of of, so of, of swag that he would <laughs> yeah. drive over with his car yeah. to crush and he had his like oh man that guy was That's crazy funny. that was like a really rough night when we had to buy weed for him. we'd go like knock on his door and be like have you got any weed because we'd run out yeah so you were there for a year and then you went back to the uk to finish school yeah mm -hmm. and how long were you back there for it ended up being two years i think i did the I did the year of, i know it was probably more like 18 months i, I did the year of finishing my degree um so um you know it was like coming back into a different year so i didn't know anybody it was pretty difficult um why well, at that point i'd actually taken at that point i'd taken two years out so i graduated the same year as my brother okay. so my brother ended up doing the same degree as me or signing up for the same degree as me two years later and then we ended up finishing together because i deferred for two years okay so the first well, that's kind of cool was a wash. And then the second <laughs> year was, um, yeah, it, yeah, and that was, it was, it was, it was nice because I didn't know anyone mm -hmm. like my, you know, um, year I graduated two years previous. So uh, it definitely helped me get through it, you know. When did you meet like John Elliott to start working on ground control? Was that before you came to this to Daily Bread or during Daily Bread or the second time around? I don't remember exactly when you started working with john oh man it was the first time i met john i would say it was definitely a daily bread uh okay. you know or out skating in socal you know like it might have been a session or something that i mean i we feel like we were out doing right i mean ground control was i mean let me see it was a uf one of the first ufs frames and it would have been around a 2001 did it launch 2000 2001 so right pretty early on i guess you started designing the brand and the logos and much everything for them right uh, so i worked on john's profile which was one of the first big so like you know as you're working on daily bread you have all the things to do to design all the pages right like um from the and then there are certain things that are always like the 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 you know the big deals about every issue so there's Obviously, the cover was always like a fucking, you know, punching match between everybody in the office. Right, like, right. Every single time the cover was a total clusterfuck. 
um section 13 section 13 yeah i believe that's right was a big was a big thing yeah. because it was the photo section so i think you know like i think as readers that's something that i always enjoyed and then you know any tar articles which were quite complicated and then obviously the big interview you know, and i think the thing i worked with john the first time was his interview so you met john and you started doing all the work for ground control which was really defined a brand even though he's no longer with it it's still like to this day your footprint you know is or your stamp is on that brand um i'd say more so than anybody who's been involved with the brand you know uh which is you know longevity which is pretty cool i mean the thing about working with john was he was just you know obviously he was he's very opinionated um and he is a he's a study of trends and uh aesthetic and clothes and um you know he pays attention to pop culture so he, he always had opinions and knew what he wanted and we were very you know i just i think like all of us right like you like me brian john we all just and Kari, we all like gravitated towards the same thing so it was just right. like you're working on something you're like oh i have an idea for how we might do this like distress thing with like crumpled up paper and he'd be like fuck yeah and then we'll add in like this thing and that thing you're just like yeah 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 just you know you're you're not trying to talk anybody into anything you just like you're clicking in like your tests and the things you're interested in and what mm -hmm. you're and he brings he bring you know it's, it, it's really looking back like i mean he's just, just a phenomenal creative direct and the thing about john that he could just see trends come in like with he had a like a superpower for it he could see like what would be trendy like way beyond it would even be showing any signs of being trendy he had these like feelings about things and i think um he'd bring things to the table that i was like oh shit that's like really forward thinking and then i think i had you know a craft in a way of like i was interested in just like how could we make something look like you know, it was all torn up and how would we do that? Or how could we make something look like this? And, you know, that brought that to the table. So it was just a good partnership. Well, John was very skilled at bringing together people for common goal. You know, yeah, he had the vision, sure. he had the vision and he knew who he wanted to use to make it happen. Um, and he was always really good at that, you know, and he was a good artist in his own. You know, I don't know if you ever saw his illustrations and stuff. But, yeah, you know, did. he was uh, he could have done some work with that as well. Did John ever talk about the ground control logo, like sickle? Well, I just remember, you know, like one of the things that was uh, really interesting about working with John was like how in the symbolism he was. And so he was always kind of looking at the meanings of things and the men kind of one of the men motifs for ground control that he wanted to use was a sickle which was part of the you know it's part of different flags it's part of the austrian flag but it's also part of like russian you know ussr um flags that i think you know a lot of people would in the west would always look at as being like you know like an evil thing or a dangerous thing but like he it, i remember him just talking about how it just stands for hard work you know i like remember that austrian, too yeah and the austrian flag there is the eagle and the sickle and you know the sickle is what people use to work the fields and like he was really proud of that and he didn't it, i just it was really interesting at the time you're we like oh this thing that like it's yeah it's like part of the ussr is the sickle but actually to a lot of people it just means like hard work and that's the symbolism of it you have to be careful with symbolism right because right. like people can take symbols that used to mean something and make them mean something else uh -huh. or like also try to take things that you that you that meant something like really bad and but like it actually you know that one stood the test of time it's i do know a lot of people you know were confronted about those ground control shirts um you know in stores people were like are you communist you know asking right. skaters like just because 
you know, small minded, you know, people here in this country. Um, yeah, totally. like to be confrontational. But, you know, I don't think, you know, communist has been, communism has been a, a danger, really anything that could negatively influence most Western countries in no. <laughs> 30, 40 years. So. Yeah. It's, uh... So, that would, yeah, I just thought it was, you know, just another, another, like, story about, like, how John would look into all the little details of things and pull meaning out of them and oftentimes have really good insight to do that do that so then you know you started working with you know we started Rattel and in what 2003 I guess you know after I had left Daily Bread in 2001 yeah and then I did the Razors video and then we started four by four and you were one of the you were the artist to design the branding and, and you know original shirts for the first few lines so the res video uh was unclowned no steal this video steal this video right? yeah the, the am video oh uh -huh. and speaking of videos let me go back to that real quick so back at daily bread mm -hmm. i was making their videos you know two of them i made um quattro yep. and no one's children yep. and quattro you did the cover art for it yep and then, mm. you know, United Front was a video I made while working yes. at Daily Bread, but it's not a Daily Bread video, but it was distributed by yeah. Daily Bread. And you did the artwork for that, which is one of my favorite, like, collaboration pieces anyone's ever done with me. That cover, yeah, I get, you know, like, Chris it Happy. So much, it was so much fun. Like, I felt like even when we'd been working together a little bit, the magazine was always a little bit like, there's me, there's you, but then there's, like, Johnny and Angie and... Buster and Shooty and fucking Kari and everyone's got an opinion and everyone wants to fight about everything. But like when we worked on those project projects, it was just like we just uh, could really just take something and work on it together and yes and you know and make something that just there was no bullshit or like having to worry about what anybody thought and it was fun and we pushed us we pushed each other and ourselves and it was just like real good real good vibe you know well i really enjoyed the nights we spent at the monroe avenue house just working together on different art projects i feel like being there with you was one of most my most creative phases of actually getting stuff done all the time because you were always I, working i was always working and it was very productive environment i feel that year you know at that house um, that's how i that's how i cut my teeth i mean i think like that gave us both a platform to try things you know you came from a background of doing new things often you know you were an early adopter of the internet you were writing code and building websites before most people were you were filming and editing you know beyond the limits of what you had access to be able to do a lot of the time we were just like trying shit and seeing right. where how we could push it and where we could what we could do with it and not worrying too much about um you know the consequences or what anybody else cared or thought it was it was a really i feel like that's something that i i don't i i don't know if i could ever get that back and i definitely don't do it enough now just experimenting and trying stuff you know you'll you'll learn so much right right um back to daily bread what was your favorite cover that you illustrated that you designed ah <sighs> shima drop rail yeah that's a great cover but also the cover that i'm not it, it it's like the fit it's my favorite cover that i ever worked on but i'm i'm not 100 percent happy with it i kind of feel like i should have left a bit more stuff off it well you had a good photo to work with which helped yes but that's <laughs> the like you know I always like doing a bit more to uh -huh. photos than, you know, the purest kind of like photography approach. But like right. looking back, I probably would have gone a little lighter on it than it, than I did. But I still thought it came out pretty well. So Sorry, back, was next question. my next question is this. When you came back to San Diego, mm -hmm. you were living in North Park again. And you lived with John and Corey at first, right? Yeah. And then we got a place later on on over there on Illinois Street and 
mm-hmm. with John and you and myself. Um, what was some of your favorite memories of, you know, of your time spent in San Diego outside of skating? Uh, or, were there, or were all your memories inside of skating? No, I just, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily inside of skating. I think definitely my fondest memories are us all just making stuff together when it felt like super good and exciting and we were just making kind of like being masters of our own destiny to a certain extent and, you know, like going through like vicious and you know obviously looked up to we you know we have like brian and john who are these like luminary rollerbladers and then Corey, who's just an incredible um point of view writer funny person yourself who was making films i was like you know like just making stuff it was it was um very liberating and like probably yeah like you said probably one of the most productive times in my life but so when, I also um, also also just you know i mean we definitely we we all just became friends beyond rollerblading so you know i getting to know everybody i mean i made what i'd consider to be you know lifelong friends during that time and um I, th- I think you know I have like a lot of fond memories of the houses and just antics and partying and you know just I feel like San Diego was a pretty magical place at the time you know we spent a lot of time in bars and hanging out with girls and um, smoking weed and you know we did have a lot of fun Lancers yeah yeah <laughs> we had a lot of- I mean, my friends from England came and stayed in our a tent in our backyard for two weeks and mm-hmm. brought girls from the bars back to the tent in the backyard <laughs> and you met, you, you met julia Coronado lancers beach. too right i met i met my wife at lancers coronado beach we used yeah. to go i mean we did a lot of shit dude. the beaches we'd always were great be out we'd always be out doing something we'd go mm-hmm. to Encinitas a lot. We'd hit. We'd go to La Jolla a lot. We'd go to Coronado Beach and swim a lot. You know, we were never. You know, it was never. I think there was a point where we kind of like got over the rope. You know, definitely with. You know, you were filming a lot and you were kind of like just working the whole weekend, right? Like you were kind of driving rollerbladers around to spots and maybe right. they did want to skate. Maybe they didn't want to skate. <laughs> like, was... well, I think a big issue for me back then, as far as skating myself goes is there was never being involved in the industry at that point at the time no one was skating to go out and have fun to skate really yeah. everyone was going out for business blading you know yeah. they were going out to film a section they were going out to shoot an interview they weren't yeah. just meeting up at the parking lot to you know skate some curbs and like have fun it was like banger 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 you know you at that point in time any single so you did your day could be over you go out and drive yeah. to a spot and then if it's a bust you're done it's like no one wants to skate because they wanted to go like exactly. get a clip specifically and and i'm not gonna you know i don't want to it's not a fun environment to try to skate in you know for me back then you know um yeah. i do think it's cool like you know we did get a lot of people from all over the world come to san diego because of daily bread and they knew that they would be in the magazine and be in the video so you know, that's why i was able to film so many good skaters I mean, the amount of people that came through, that's the other thing is like, like all the people we met, everybody, you know, I, I, I feel bad because there were like so many people coming through San Diego. There's probably so many people that we met and spent really great time with that I don't know if I'd remember their name. <laughs> uh, it happens to me, you know, there's skaters that are, you know, well known, have never stopped. And they're like, you know, yeah. we stayed at your house for a week. You know, like, um, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely, you know, a lot of fun in San Diego skating. Um, I remember, you know, we go up to Orange County and got some clips of you in one of those videos doing a half cab topsail in that long yep. rail. And that was, you know, like hanging out with Carl and Jeff and 
Saya. I was basically the San, San Clemente crew for a mm-hmm. while. And you moved to San Clemente after San Diego. Oh, uh, Marcus. But you moved there. Yeah, so that was that was post Daily Bread. Yeah, so Daily Bread. Mm. You you worked for Daily Bread. <laughs> we don't have to get too deep into it because I know it's That's like right. stuff I don't, you know, that whole Daily Bread affected every all of us in San Diego at the time. So, yeah. but, you know, Daily Bread ended. <clears throat> um, and, you know, we all knew it was kind of like inevitable just with the state of blading itself and, you know, Black advertisers and you know magazines were on the you know ver- that's when it kind of going out in decline and you know it's just evolution with the times and so you worked there until the very end though right I mean you were one I, of the last I, di- I didn't technically I I sent the last printed um sent the last printed issue to the printer but then after that. I, I didn't get paid like Ryan or Justin or any of the other employees, also, you know, Rusty. Um, I can't remember who else was there at the time. You know, I, the money had dried up and um, I had to pay rent. So I, I quit. Mm-hmm. So I, I actually quit before Ryan and Justin stayed on. Um, beyond me leaving for a little while but yeah it was close so you was did Wes driver replace you yes yeah so okay so Wes yes yeah all right that's what I I kind of forgot I I think like Wes came down and he was you know uh I can't remember if yeah he was he was involved and helping out and that was kind of like a so I we we had a meeting in a coffee shop in Golden Hill, and you know it was it was a meeting to talk about you know like really figuring out what was going to happen with the next issue, and that was when I let everybody know that I, I couldn't had to go, and then I borrowed five hundred bucks from my mum to buy John Elliot's girlfriend's Jetta car so I could drive to Orange County for a job interview, because well I basically like when I realized that. I needed to leave and I was going to have a job. I just, I would, I, I just happened to be chatting to Brian Konerski and he was like, Hey dude, I'm working with these guys at a magazine in Orange County and they're, it's an English publisher. And why do you talk to them? And he kind of hooked me up. So I went up there for an interview and um, yeah, thanks to Brian Konerski, I was able to move to, they had, it was a auto, Art of Sport magazine. So it was um, published by Haymarket, which is a giant English conglomerate publisher. And they'd bought this US, it was called Racer magazine, which was IndyCar, um, Top Fuel, just like a bunch of um, Art of Sport. So I went to like a, I went from Daily Bread to like a big kind of like more organized publication. Like a little bit more organized or a lot more organized? I wouldn't say a lot more organized. Okay. Actually. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, medium, medium more organized. Medium more organized, just more yeah. corporate. Yeah, but they were in uh, based in Irvine, and my wife and I, I, like my girlfriend at the time, moved to San Clemente, California, um, which was about a thirty-minute drive to Irvine from there. Mm-hmm. San Clemente is beautiful. I, I have to give Kari Casey. Uh, a shout out here because when I went to England because I'd moved jobs I had to change my visa so I flew back to England and we were moving I'd accepted the job and we were moving up to Orange County and I was like you know hey uh, Julia my girlfriend I have to leave and go to England to get my visa changed I'll be gone for like 10 days or whatever she was like okay great I ended up getting stuck in England so Kari ended up moving my girlfriend from San Diego to San Clemente <laughs> while I was stuck in England fixing my visa issues. So thank you, Kari. Kari's a great guy, <laughs> you know, always been nothing but kind and helpful. Um, I miss that guy a lot. So, yeah. so uh, yeah, so then you end up 
moving to Orange County and you moved on a street right by where Jeff Stockwell grew up. Yeah, yeah, a couple right of streets. Down those, right down those famous ledges that he always skated as a kid. Yep. And back to skating, when did you kind of start skating less and phase out of aggressive skating altogether? Oh, man. So we were... So I've been in the Bay Area for five years. Before that, I was in Richmond, Virginia for five years. I didn't really skate in Richmond, so 10 years. 10 years. So yeah. you were skating. Uh, I mean, you came when you came to Austin for South by Southwest, and we skated um, at House Park. W yeah. W w were you living in Richmond at that point? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I had a pair of skates. That was, that was probably like one of, a handful of times I had skated a skate park in that five years. Now it's funny because I, I was going to say it's funny now because now I know that there's a, a skate scene in Richmond. Oh, there is. Yeah, and I'm I'm Juan Mosquito lives somewhere out there now, and he skates oh, in that really? area. Wow. <laughs> yeah, um, and I, there might have been a skate scene back then too, but I wasn't you know aware of the skaters. There wasn't really like a dirt. I, I think we found some parks there wasn't richmond's i wouldn't say it's like the type of city you go to where you're like i just have to rollerblade all this amazing stuff you know right. it's pretty like you have to go get it you have to go find it but no there was one of the reasons that i really you know um decided for myself that i had to stop like 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 aggressive skating or skating park and street was I had really extensive surgery on both of my wrists so I have what's called a vascularized spider plate and it's the same surgery I had a I had a broken meniscus so or like sorry anyway there's like a bone right here it's mm -hmm. not a meniscus there's like a bone right here that um I shattered in my palm that my my hand was basically collapsing so they had to oh, put wow. a a plate over the, the remaining plates of my palm and they take a bone from your wrist with a vein still attached to it shove it in there and they'll like drill a plate on top of it so did that happen? like these zipper scars wow. on both on both of my wrists and it was like the exact same surgery on both wrists so i have li very limited i have more surgery to have i have a lot of like kind of like arthritis and very limited movement with both yeah. my hands and so you know i made the decision and when i put my skates on i tell myself i'm going to be safe and not do a lot and then before you know it i'm like bruised and you know i i love doing it it's just hard for me to really pull back so the only way to i feel like i mean i earn my living with these i need them and I can't really, you know, it's not, I don't feel like responsible of me to um, damage them anymore. So right. I just made myself a promise. I was going to um, not do park and street anymore, but I have gotten um, some one tens and I'm really enjoying doing Wait, distance skate. Where do you skate at on those? Man, this area in Alameda, California, there's a loop of trails that I can do 10 miles. It's all on just like paved trails right out of the, right out of my, house flat it's perfect fantastic yeah i remember yeah. alameda being fairly flat when i was there back in a long time ago in fact it's all, it's all um, landfill. <laughs> do you do you do you uh are you friends with any skaters in the bay area you hang out with anybody up there i saw uh, bj bernhardt a couple of months ago i had coffee with brian shima last year but other than that, no, just just reaching out to old friends. I mean, I bump into people. There's, it's funny. There's like so many bladers that are like, I know Ryan Northway is out there doing, you know, tech stuff. It's funny. Like I hear from here and there is like, oh, Rollerblad is in charge of that, or Rollerblad is doing this. It's kind of cool. Right. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> well, it's it's very cool to see some of the work that skaters are doing that you know we knew back in the day. Now you know they've yeah. gotten so good at their trades. Um, especially with the video and design people. I know um, Cal, Cal Sturgis is up in here. And, uh, uh, oh, man. Um, yeah, uh, Cal's up here. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of... I, I keep, I you know, I keep uh, an eye on the Juice of Fools 
what they're doing in Cameron and Eric Garcia and everything they're putting out in the Bay Area is like all amazing. So speaking of just sucker pools, do you recall my old oh, purple, God. my old car, my Buick Roadmaster? Yeah. And a road trip, you, yes, myself, and Justin you Buchanan that. made up to the Bay Area. Oh, was that just was that Justin? It was Justin Buchanan from Australia. You know, I completely ed- I completely edited Justin out of that story in my head. Oh really? If you wouldn't have if you wouldn't have told me that, I would not have known that Justin was on that trip. Yeah, it was Justin and it was New Year's and we ended up this parties were crazy. It snowed. We slept in the car. What do you remember from that trip? I remember swearing that I was never going to go to the Bay Area ever again in my entire life after we left. I remember a, <laughs> a tall, white, curly, blonde, curly-haired individual that was at a house party that we got to when we got to the Bay Area doing being uh, being about as terrifying as I've ever n- known any other human being be and be super aggressive and I don't know like what whether he was just like on psychedelics or what but and, and what I mean he, did, he ended up oh no Pat Lennon was hitting golf balls out of the doorway when we when we got there I think yeah the cars yeah but and yeah I don't remember who was there all I remember Johnny Hedges was there uh, rest in peace. Yeah. And um, I can't remember who that was, but I do remember he broke a hole in the wall. He peed in the closet. I remember me and you being asleep on the couch, just being like, we can't fucking ignore this. And we were like, for trying to pretend we were asleep. We were just like, what the fuck is going on with this dude? Well, you remember the worst part of the night is he left for a while. They thought he was gone, and you hear a scream oh, yeah. from next door because he went to yes. the neighbor's house and woke her up because he thought it was the house we we're in, and freaked her out. And then shows up with no shoes, and it was didn't he like technically like break into her house, like kick the door in? I, I don't remember. Deal? I just remember it was it was uh, one hell of a trip. To say the least. So, what are you doing now? What do you? So, you're in the Bay Area. What's what yeah. are you? Where are you working at? What are you doing? What's keeping you busy? So, I work for a company called One Medical. Um, we're a primary care provider. We're in twelve markets of the U.S. So, basically, like if you have health insurance, um, you you pay one ninety nine one hundred ninety nine dollars a year membership for the whole year, and you know, in markets where we have offices or offices are like really nice and we have tech that can um, help you get like an appointment today or the next day. We have like loads of availability. We salary our doctors so they don't, um, you know, like a lot of places where you go see the doctor, they get like frequency bonuses. So, you know, it's like as many people as they can see in one day is for primary care is how much you can get paid. But um like our providers are it doesn't matter like every they you know they have more time to spend with people so so it's primary care and right. then i do i work with the chief marketing officer and we uh, do all the the marketing for one medical is it uh working for a company like that is it different than being at all the ad agencies or is it similar it's really 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 different mm-hmm. um you know like there is pros and cons to both but i've really enjoyed working brand side you know like i I did 15 years in advertising and um i really enjoyed it and it was very challenging did a lot of like cool stuff but i'm definitely enjoying um working directly for a brand what's uh do you have um of all the projects you've done over the years for you know advertising agencies and blading like is there like a few that stand out as your favorite or you're most proud of working on yeah, I think, you know, definitely uh, working for Daily Bread was a highlight. Um, ground control, working with you on films, you know, was always, was always, you know, like looking back as like some of the most fun work I did for sure. I think like in advertising is probably, we did a project called Awesome Cross that I don't know how it was 
uh, six or seven years ago now, and it was for BF Goodrich, which was a tire company. And it was like an experiential, it was out here in LA, basically like rigged up um, drivers and the cars to like EKG machines and then put GeForce monitors on the tires and the cars like registered the GeForce and the um, EKG monitors and the helmets like registered their stress and stuff. So it was like a live kind of like read out of what was going on on the track and we like had created all the it was like a like a fully experiential thing for a drive-in and that was wild like we got to wrap the cars with graphics and just design every little piece like we each uh participant that were like all influencers and drivers got a tire and their we laser etched their experience onto the tire and we got to like custom design every little piece of it. That was a little bit ahead of its time, but definitely fun. And then we did, we did a lot of work for Aria. We did a campaign called Wonderfield for Aria that ended up like we pitched it. We won it from Mondelez, which is the company that owns Aria. And then it took it ended up turning into a global campaign. We did a like twelve artist series. We got Jeff McFetridge to do some work. Jeff Sutter. And a bunch of other people and that went up all around the world like huge buildings in brazil it was like these characters the aria was ahead and then the artists like filled in the rest of the thing and it's amazing that was, that was really cool yeah that's so, really yeah, cool those are a couple that stand out this year you got your u.s citizenship yeah congratulations Thank and you. uh what made you decide to get your u.s citizenship uh, you know, we, we I've been in the U.S. for 21 years, and thanks to you and you know everyone that made me feel at home and welcome and looked after me. And I have two, my, my wife's American, and we have two American kids, and I'm not going anywhere. So, um, you know, I love this country, and I want to stay, and this is my life now, so it made sense. And you still retain your British citizenship. I've renounced my, technically renounced my my allegiance to the queen. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the way it goes is as long as you have a British birth certificate, you can get a British passport. So, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I have um, both a German and a American, U.S. passport. Yeah. Yeah. Fun know. Functionally, I mean, I'm not like a British citizen, but, you know, I think I'll always uh, try to keep a UK passport. Yeah. You know, what I do have here at the house which you haven't seen in a while is yeah. so when we started vicious you know it was supposed mm -hmm. to be kind of a project between you me and john it didn't really end up that way um yeah. and you know we did our first tour before the brand launched we had mike yeah. come down stockwell uh chris cheshire um poncho you know everybody came yeah. down and we did the photo shoot in the backyard we screen yeah. printed all those shirts by hand on that yes, you know, one color press yeah. And you cut out that huge Medusa logo that yes. we, as a template that we use to to screen that flag. And I still yep. have that template. Oh, wow. Yeah, I do. But it's so, you know, when you made it, you did it on paper and you're like, I should have done it on plastic because it's like folds in. You know, it's like yeah. folding. So these are the adhesive spray. But I have that template rolled up still here at the house. That's I was awesome. Thinking, yeah, I was thinking about trying to get some adhesive spray and making a couple of, uh, flags or something before it disintegrates all the way if you could photograph it fairly flat mm -hmm. i could put like a good size file together i could probably recut it oh really you know mm -hmm. like just to get the uh the art from it like yeah i will uh i'll definitely take a photo for you but that was really cool you know basically uh sonder our friend sonder knook came over um he shot the photos in the garage for the first ads of Vicious. We had a some sort of like boa constrictor or something that we borrowed or rented. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, someone brought it. a snake. Then the next day, I left with everybody except Micah on tour. Sean San Maria, stuff. Poncho, Cheshire, Ryan Shooty came to shoot photos for Daily Bread. It ended up being a Daily Bread story. Lonnie Gallegos came to be second camera. And we did a kind of a family trip to Arizona. Uh, Grand Canyon, Flintstone Village, all that stuff came back. And, but that was before we even got 
the actual clothes in. Like we did that whole promo thing in the backyard. And I thought that was a really fun project. Um, yeah, those were the, that, that was the, you know, like, you know, it's like looking back on it, all I see is the fun we had doing it, you know, mm-hmm. like I don't, it's, it's, you, you know, like I'm, I'm still proud of the work, like even the, like looking back, it's a little bit like, oh yeah, we're like kind of full of ourselves and goofy and, you know, but it's, it's still fun and I just, I think it was, it was like nice to be in a place where we didn't worry about what anybody thought we were just like making it and we thought it was cool and it was yeah. just like we don't really care if anybody well, else thinks I it's mean, cool the, the just, things we created <laughs> with Ratchel, Vicious and 44 were like yeah. a lot of the industry hated it a lot of the other owners yes. like they hated what we did they thought it was lame stupid but it generated a following yeah. of a lot of skaters and a lot of those skaters were influenced uh, to, to, to this day based on the style you know of John and the writers and the music you know we had the videos and like we really helped form some people's like persona and I just think it's like you know like our interest like all the you know I was into like Joy Division has always been my most favorite band like I've been reading Low Down like which was this like super deep German uh, skateboarding magazine that I thought was at the front end of like art direction and publication art at the time like you were super into like old school you know like we were watching John Waters videos and like listening to the cramps and New York Dolls and stuff that I'd never really gotten into John was coming from like he was like super in a tattoo art and vintage thing and like everything from brutalism to you know and you know your Kari coming in from um just being in a writing and making stuff and filming and you know it just it was everyone we, we were all interested in the same stuff the same music the same um influences so yeah it was like you said like no one else was really doing that at the time i guess yeah it was uh i think we did something special i think all we missed was someone to hold it all together <laughs> you know on yeah. some some sort of aspect of it i don't know um maybe a little bit more professionalism on the business side of things you know we had you know maybe marketing and art and everything down you know pretty well um i also i mean i will say i think the timing was a big factor it just was like we were doing all our stuff when the industry was just dying right like right. it just was like it was the last like <laughs> by your role splitting <laughs> right we were like doing all of that stuff so had we been doing it in a different era a la you know i i don't want to compare what we were doing to what anybody else did but like obviously you know there was a time when senate was in a formative place and there was just arlo and you know a bunch of people all like making shit and they that like senate became like a national brand for better or for right. worse like you know well i, I mean just, it was definitely depressing a sign of the time you know we were doing a lot of things and we we're trying to do a lot of things but you know the sport like you said it was not as big as it had been there wasn't the money um we didn't have the money to do things we weren't making really that much money and we were yeah. always holding on to the hope that blading would have a revival you know right and it didn't you know now it's having one you know if we would have been able to stick around till now we would have finally seen you know some sort of something 20 something years later you know yeah. but that's a long time to hold on to so having these ideas and not being able to do them just because of the money and you know no one everyone was struggling you know me you brian john like you know living a good life to an extent but you know it was like there's nothing nobody had anything to hold really hold on to nobody had a house nobody had you yeah. know savings and yeah no um, one was skating no one was skating it was it was on the air yeah, especially in the u.s yeah. it was like after 9 11 it just you know people had other things to do and, and so you know after years of 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 that environment was it was even motivating for everybody you know um yeah and you know and then it was done and then but you know seeing it come back now like 
Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I'm, I'm glad the sport's growing. I'm glad more people are going out skating in all disciplines of skating. You know, I think that recreational skating is going the fastest, obviously, because people getting outside with COVID. Um, but you have a lot of people back to blading, like you said earlier, um, you know, reminiscing. I, know, just... I, I mean, I do hope like for there, you know, there are those, you know, people in skating that have been there forever. And like, I hope that it's like really good for them, you know, like to see John and John, like John Julio and everything that they're doing at them. And like, you know, you see skaters of just, always been skating and you know i just it, it, it's nice to think that maybe they're like some people that have been you know part of the industry for forever and are still doing it they're like getting like being able to you know earn some some somewhat of a living from it That'd right be really nice well think. john julio's doing great you know, i'm very happy for him he's you know he yeah. also he also was around you know with val and everything I mean, yeah, he's yeah, been part know, of Matt, industry Matt forever. Mickey, Matt, I saw Matt like mm -hmm. opening a star in yeah, he Santa got Monica. His, Santa Monica Tuition, shop, yeah. You know, that's it's fantastic. You know, those those are the the people that you know their hearts always been there. They've always been great, do great people, just doing wonderful things mm -hmm. and for the right reasons. So yeah, I yeah, think the the whole them thing is the is uh is very impressive. You know, just the connections they're making outside of skating and yeah, and you know how they're you know, paying writers and all the content they're coming out with. And that's one thing, you know, Julio and his group of friends, um, you know, with, with all the brands in the past, they were so good at creating content, you know, on their websites, videos, you know, tutor stories, like anytime they went somewhere, they had great content, you know, documenting it. And I always admire that with those guys, you know, that's something we couldn't do very well with Rattel, you know, did a lot of trips, but we didn't have a lot to show for it um so i always thought that was pretty good you know but they had you know they had you know um brandon smith you know shooting photos a great photographer you know he's always there Yvonne, you know like i mean he has a there's a great circle of people sorry i say it differently what yeah. how do you say it one of uh, Yvonne, oh, I don't, one it. of us one of us would is you right. be mad if i called him ivan um but yeah so you know there's a great circle of people that have made them just a wonderful company doing cool things What's up, well let's talk about you what's up with big wheel blading dude so big wheel blading um is a website i started it actually just had the four-year anniversary last week uh i did not do any sort of celebration for it um but the logo what, where'd you get that so well big wheel blading first of all if you've seen the logo chris designed it it's one of his probably last uh blading designs you did I'm putting that shit on my portfolio, actually. I'm, right. I'm See? still super stoked with that. So he branded the Big Wheel Blading. Um, but Big Wheel Blading, basically, you know, I had a big, it's when people started skating bigger wheel skates, I had the idea of, of starting a website to promote all disciplines of skating because I always thought, like, back in the day, you know, when you and I were working in an industry, we thought we were the coolest shit there was. And, you know, and we didn't think any other type of skating was like, we didn't even think about it. You know, we didn't care. We thought it was stupid, whatever. And same with other forms of skating. Speed skater just never thought what we did was cool. You know, um, I don't know about slalom, but slalom's gotten you know way bigger than it ever was. And, and you have different types of disciplines, you know, like distance skaters and marathons and whatever, all this thing, these things. And, and, I always felt that our sports never grew that well because everybody was separate of each other. You know, yeah. the whole, it, the whole sport of skating itself should be growing together. You know, all the different disciplines should be growing together. Not, you shouldn't have like biking, blading, boarding events. It should be like speed skating, slalom, you know, um, aggressive, all that stuff. Kind of like they do with the world skate now. And, and, you know, they had in Spain and they're having one in, again, in like Columbia, I believe. Um, but the idea was a web of the website was to just focus on all of those different disciplines, unite them, introduce skaters of different disciplines to each other with heavily promoting aggressive skating at the back end, because that's my history, right? So it was kind of like promote all the different skating, but at the same time, show them a lot of aggressive skating. And I noticed, you know, throughout the past four years, a lot of slalom skaters have picked up aggressive skating. Um, you have a lot of 
marathon skaters, you know, doing aggressive, a lot of aggressive really skaters cool. are doing marathons, do big wheel, you know, big wheel blading. And, you know, there's people who hate on it, but I was, you know, the, the idea of this website was to. So what, I mean, you just said there are people that hate on it. Well, it's just the, they don't, the change, you know, people don't like change, not on a website, but just the concept of aggressive skaters skating on big wheels because are they you, think it's you... taking away. You've from heard that, the sport. You've heard I've, that I've been from people. I, I've been told that opinion from people, yeah. And you know, it's just silly. It's just that old way of thinking, you know, and there's no room for an old way of thinking because it did nothing for the sport. And it's the only thing I it's the only thing I don't miss about the mainstream kind of like street park aggressive rollerblading scene is that like insularism and like a you know vibe that like you can only do a certain thing a certain way and if you right. do anything else it's like not just like you have, you have to do this and nothing else so i weird. feel like most people grew <laughs> out of that you know but there's still people sticking yeah. you know holding on to it and the thing that, so, so the strange. website the website was supposed to be a really big concept you know i was going to have a lot of people contributing do a lot of stories a lot of interviews yeah. a lot of stuff and i was you know trying to get advertisers and you know you remember how much money daily bread made in advertising money back then. you know like ridiculous amounts of money and you know i'm trying to pull like 150 dollars off people and like nobody wants to advertise nobody you know and i realized within the first like six months that nobody in the industry except a handful of companies want to support it which means you know after depends solely on people volunteering to contribute because my idea was to pay photographers pay writers you know to to create something cool yeah off off ad money but if nobody's gonna advertise and people have to do stuff for free well nobody wants to do stuff for free especially now you know when they're in their 30s and 40s maybe when you're like 20 you know yeah and trying to get somewhere so it's been disappointing you know because no one's really stepped in to contribute i mean i have some people write stuff here and there but you know, it's, uh, it's, I, you know, to do something for free, you know, I spent a lot of time on that website over the years and don't make money off, but it takes a lot, you know, it's like, how much can I do? You know, like, this is more fun yeah. to me now talking to you and, you know, editing this versus interviewing you for the website and having to transcribe it afterwards, you know, and edit the text. And, you know, it's, that was a lot of work interviewing people from foreign countries, translating it, you know, like, uh, transcribing whatever so you know it's well, kind of like i mean just you know i think like it's a shame that there is not a commercially viable way of doing it apparently but like thanks for doing it because i'm sure you've brought a lot of people around the world like a lot of connection and a lot of grit you know i think this is you know one of the sad parts of still to this day being involved in the you know the blading scene and it's just like you just you either do it off this you know you do it off your own back and there's no other way of doing it there are, and you know there are people like yourself that that do do that and i think that's just commendable and yeah you know i mean it's, it's i've done it doing it well i appreciate it you know i've st stuck with this blading mm -hmm. you know everything i've tried to do since i started scout magazine and you know 95 was promote inline skating or aggressive inline skating yeah. and you know never really made money off of it and but love it so you know i've stuck with it for you know what 30 years now yeah we're you know, working roots in, roots for in it years, and you know? uh and so you know this this new youtube channel is it seems like a pretty fun transition um i can catch up with people i haven't talked to in a while reminisce on old videos and i still plan on creating content for the big wheel blading website that will tie in with episodes from the show so for instance, I was doing a lot of, um, you know, interviews with artists. Um, I think I sent you some of those, um, but I actually yeah. I'd probably start doing the interviews more on the channel and then having supplements three stories on the website with like the images and, you know, the artwork. It's awesome. It's a stuff great like idea. That. Um, yeah. And that way I can tie the two together and maybe draw more traffic to the website from the YouTube channel. So, you know, yeah. we'll see what happens with that. Yeah, it's great. And like video content, I feel like it's a really great way for people to digest. I think um, that the video is king yeah. right now. You know, no one, I'm not, I'm, I can't say no one, but a lot of people don't want to read anymore. You know, 
yeah. they they don't want to sit on the computer and read text. They'd rather listen to it in audio book form or a podcast or you know watch it on YouTube. Uh, so it's you know it's definitely changed. Um, that's I why love, I love the Vermonting idea too. By the way. Oh yeah, I put up the new episode of Vermont today. Me and my mom picking mushrooms in the yeah, woods. It's rad. <laughs> like I would, I can't wait to watch it. I'd like need to know more about I've been mushroom picking and I feel like I'm gonna kill myself. So I need I need to know this stuff. It's I kinda idea. wish that I would have started the show when I began the project in the woods because I I've cleared so much out already and I've done so much and I've built so much, but I still have a lot to do. So um yeah. and like you know, I'm gonna incorporate basically you know, forging and building stuff with property, clearing property, reviewing different tools and, you know, s stuff from our hikes and skiing. And, um, you know, it's a, where I live here in Northern Vermont, it's called Northeast Kingdom. It's, it's a very outdoor adventure type of place. You know, it's, yeah. it has some of the biggest mountain bike trails on the East Coast here. It's got the, you know, tons of gravel roads. It's got hiking everywhere, lakes for swimming. Uh, in my town, we have two ski areas. We have like a rail park for skiing, two skate parks, and there's 6,000 people live here. And we have the mountain bike trail system. So it's yeah, like, it's amazing. you know, there's a lot of stuff to do besides eat. That's one thing, food, <laughs> you know, up here, it's not that good. That's why I miss being able to go to Quebec. You know, the Montreal's got really good food in Quebec City. Maybe even Boston, go to Chinatown in Boston or something. Um, but I haven't really traveled since COVID. Well, I mean, when you're when you're finding oyster mushrooms and chanterelles on your land, I'm sure you can uh, turn that into some some delicious homemade food pretty quickly too. Well, one thing I'm doing for the first time is my girlfriend and I picked oh probably six seven gallon bags of blackberries because we have so many blackberries here, and we're gonna start making blackberry jam. Make some preserves. So. And my mom's gonna help because she was an expert, you know, used to make that. So, but yeah. we could probably probably make like twenty or thirty, you know, jars of blackberry jam from that. Um, and maybe I'll just I'll, maybe I'll open a farm stand. I was kind of thinking that I had a farm stand because now we're doing growing plants and getting into wild I mean, edi wild edibles and some and just some big some big wheel blading jam. Well, yes, actually, there's a few things I'm gonna be doing. <laughs> is i plan on we plan on mapling next year yeah so we're gonna do maple we're gonna run like 30 maple taps so wow. start making our own maple syrup and this is like from trees on your lawn we have yeah we have at least 400 maple trees in the property oh and and then we're gonna start doing bees so i want to start doing honey maple jams so cool dude and then like just some small veggie batches um but I was thinking about like branding it and selling it on the side, but you know, documenting it all on the YouTube channel, which would be cool. Vermonting is like I saw you put the name out. Was that was that did someone suggest that or was well, that yeah? Chosen or so it... it was something I've heard people say, and then I made a post asking people for suggestions, and there was a couple really good ones. There was the fuzzy forager, which <laughs> which which is what I think I'm going to call the dude for the brand of the jelly. And then um, one of the San Diego guys from, you know, back of John's old friends out there, he had a suggestion, which was pretty good. The Yomber Jack. That was pretty good. I saw so that one. I thought I that was pretty funny. Card, yeah. Um. And then somebody put Vermonting, but it's just the Vermonting. I like the other ones, but they were too specific on a, one type of thing. And Vermonting was definitely very inclusive. Dude, I saw you chose everything that. Vermont. Like, oh, it's so good. <laughs> Perfect. So good. So um, it was good talking to you. Say hi to Julie. And uh, man, I will. And I will. Uh, I will let you know about that that magazine thing. Yeah, it sounds really cool. Like, let's yeah, just just hit me up as you, as you're getting an idea of like what you want to do with it, and what yeah, let's just keep in touch, keep talking. All right, sounds good. I will talk to you soon.
Miss you, buddy. Miss you too. Take care, Chris. You too.